Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Although um, it should really be Sebastian Oman standing here, who actually has done most of the work that I'm going to uh, talk about. So this was all um, in um, the attempt to use uh, a new mesh code, uh, the repo code, for simulating um, the plunge in and maybe a little bit of the um, uh, phase after this more common envelopes. And um, would you actually introduce the <coughs> work methods already? So uh, I start with uh, one major part of Sebastian's work that was actually to define uh, setups for the simulations and as you mentioned before, so, so the uh, fundamental issue that we have here is usually that we have to map a stellar profile from a, hydro, um, from a um, stellar vision code where hydrostatic equilibrium uh, is in the model by construction to hydrodynamical code where hydrostatic equilibrium is just um, a special solution but it's not uh, explicitly enforced. So therefore, we have to care about these things whether the profile um, <coughs> is stable over long time scales that we set up in the hydro code to um, follow the common envelope solution we need uh, to be stable for many dynamical time scales. Um, this is hard because the envelope is only loosely bound and we have a wide uh, range of temporal and spatial scales. And now, um, the scale problem, as already discussed many times uh, in this workshop, is actually um, usually uh, addressed uh, by replacing um, the core of the giant star with a point class that interacts only gravitationally um, with a certain um, <coughs> gravitational softening length. Um, if um, <coughs> you actually keep the rest of the envelope uh, as taken from the um, stellar model, then this is not really uh, a resolution independent approach. So therefore, Sebastian actually um, <coughs> tried to develop a procedure where the inner part of um, the, the star is really cut out uh, up to a radius of about the gravitational you know, something length and replaced by a stable structure um, that actually at the same time uh, guarantees that the outer profile from that stable structure would uh, look very similar to the original uh, envelope of the star. And this is achieved by solving uh, this modified plane dendrite equation um, with the uh, potential of the point mass representing the core being included. And then uh, we stitch these two profiles together. Um, um, to uh, with the inner profile with the uh, outer profile of the stellar envelope um, at the cut radius in a smooth way, and in this way, uh, one can actually uh, construct um, in a reliable way resolution independent uh, giant models for these simulations. Now, the next problem is then the question of how you map into uh, the hydrodynamical uh, code, which may have a different equation of state. Uh, so, many of the published simulations actually. Um, <coughs> use an ideal gas equation of state, whereas the uh, stellar model was usually computed with, say, the Mesa equation of state, including recombination effects and so on. So that means that the profile that we map is not necessarily in hydrostatic equilibrium. Therefore, only a few base quantities are mapped, density and pressure. But this actually then guarantees uh, mechanical equilibrium, but not necessarily the same thermal structure as the original star. Um, so convective, pro convective properties are not necessarily retained by this mapping procedure. So you map, for instance, from a meso model with a convective envelope to a hydrodynamical code with an ideal gas equation of state, then uh, the envelope will not be uh, convective anymore. So therefore, uh, we actually use a different base quantity for the mapping and the hydrostatic uh, reconstruction, and that's the difference between the te temperature gradient and the adiabatic gradient. So here in for um, uh, convection, and this actually then guarantees that we have the same convective pattern in our model star. Now, of course, all this doesn't matter if you actually use exactly the same equations of state in the cell evolution and hydrodynamics code, but still, this method actually allows you to arbitrarily change the convective behavior of the star by just changing uh, the difference in these gradients. Now, <clears throat> then in the end, we have to uh, construct a 3D uh, representation of the 1D uh, cell profile, and uh, the um, but the flexible and structured moving mesh of the repo gives us different choices. Uh, Sebastian actually tested a number of possibilities here. Our method of choice is a Euclid's tessellation on spherical shells, uh, but uh, you found that it actually has little effect on the final outcome as long as we have the moving uh, mesh actually uh, doing its job and this adapts to the geometry. So therefore, uh, this is not so important, but if you actually work on a, on a static mesh, this actually may happen. Then, um, <coughs> Mapping from a hydrostatic uh, uh, stellar evolution code uh, to a hydrodynamical code. The hydrodynamical code usually has uh, lower resolution, and um, this actually leads to discretization errors and spurious velocity uh, fluctuations uh, will occur, and maybe the star also starts to oscillate, and this is usually then damped out uh, on the certain times. 
So we also have to do this damping procedure, um, but um, of course one wants to avoid to do this damping too harshly to the star uh, to not change the profile. So therefore one can actually think about criteria of the resolution that we need in order to actually keep these spurious velocity fluctuations from uh, discretization errors as low as possible. And so Sebastian worked this out based on work by Mike Singali, and uh, you can come up with a criterion that gives you the Mach number of the spurious velocity fluctuations due to discretization errors, depending on uh, what kind of Riemann solve you use, and depending on how well you resolve the pressure scale height in uh, your um, stellar model. Or you can actually then uh, ask the question, so how well do we have to resolve the pressure scale height to keep the uh, Mach number of the uh, velocity fluctuations it also special. Now with these uh, setup models, Sebastian has performed um, common ML simulations, and um, so it's standard showcase example uh, is uh, a two solar mass uh, a giant and a uh, one solar mass companion star. The companion in many of the simulations was placed at the surface of the red giant, but Sebastian also tested different other um, initial setups. Uh, in the first set of models, we um, modeled pure hydro with an ideal mass equation of states, so that means no hydro uh, no magnetic fields in, involved and no ionization effects. And then the um, simulations look like here. So this is a cut to the XY plane, and you see the two uh, cores of the um, stellar cores orbiting each other, uh, indicated by the plus and plus here, and the outer envelope actually sort of uh, develops this complicated uh, morphology. This is the overall um, <coughs> outcome of the simulation. Uh, so we followed the evolution in this particular setup for about 80 orbits, and only 0.1 solar masses of the envelope material, that's 8% of the envelope was ejected, predominantly in the first uh, few orbits. Uh, and uh, this is how the distance is actually, um, <coughs> uh, the orbit distance has changed, very similar to what other simulations find as well. Now one can uh, characterize the evolution of the envelope um, in different phases. So the first is the rapid plunging phase in the first orbit that's shown here. Um, so this then um, leads to an eccentric orbit of the two star cores and um, the shock from the companion star reaches uh, the inner part of the envelope and um, <coughs> around the um, red giant core and other shock wave forms. And uh, most of the material that finally gets unbound is already uh, ejected in this first orbit. And in the second orbit, um, the red giant shock or um, structure takes over the tidal arm of the companion. Um, and uh, yeah, later on, after a few orbits, the later structure um, forms uh, shear flows in the outer layers um, where the flows are subsonic, um, lead to carbon hamel sensibilities. And uh, you see these carbon hamel features appearing uh, here. Later on, um, the carbon hamel sensibilities stronger and the spiral structure tightens and uh, <coughs> then um, the uh, final degree instability in adjacent layers starts to open up and we form uh, large scale um, um, instability patterns uh, that now dominate uh, the entire morphology of the envelope but in the, in the center still uh, the spiral structure um, is um, uh, generated by the two orbiting cores. Finally, um, uh, when we end our simulation, the spiral structure is completely washed out by the instabilities. Uh, the cores are still very resolved, and flow between them is uh, smooth. Now, we take this as the onset of convective instability. Uh, this is analyzed according to the um, <coughs> sorbic content criterion. Uh, the uh, orange patches here are unstable to that criterion. You see that they are uh, found all over the place, and um, this actually uh, indicates convective instability. Now we've also done an MAT simulations with a slight uh, uh, weak magnetic uh, initial field um, and uh, follow the application here. This was discussed before. We have different phases where initially a strong amplification happens around the uh, companion star, um, then a slow amplification in discretion stream uh, that has formed around the companion star. And finally, we get a separation when the magnetic field is dispersed over the entire envelope and we end up with magnetic field strength on the order of 10 to 100 kilogauss. Um, this is just um, a wrap up of these things. So uh, the dynamical impact uh, is rather small. We get only slightly more material ejected than in the non mhd simulation. And the magnetic field strength that we find is uh, still too low to explain magnetic white force. It's also not clear how to anchor these magnetic fields, uh, rapidly changing magnetic fields on the uh, white force surface. Now, um, Sebastian in his PhD thesis that was cited before already had some uh, simulations that included 
um, recombination energy by putting in the Apollo equation of state. This assumes, of course, as we discussed, local energy dep uh, deposition. Uh, what we find here is that <coughs> uh, compared to simulations uh, with an ideal gas equation of state down here, we get much more materially ejected um, with uh, uh, the Apollo equation of state. Um, here are different criteria uh, for evaluating which part of the material is unbound. So the um, uh, pink line and the yellow line are uh, just evaluated according to the kinetic energy of the material that we have. And the blue line here is a uh, lower resolve but longer simulation that's about to carry out. We actually get a substantial uh, ejection of material. In this case, uh, recently, uh, last assumed by Cook looked into uh, different um, primary stars, HB stars. Challenge here is, of course, that the envelope of these uh, is uh, much harder to stabilize numerically. Um, but as I said, my master's student did some simulations. Here's the outcome with different um, <coughs> Q values. And uh, you see, again, that we get a significant mass ejection only if we take the other equation to account in recombination that is um, considered. Okay, so that's it, I think. My time is up. Uh, conclusions well, this is all work in progress. We are currently working on including uh, radiation transfer to see whether the uh, assumption of local energy deposition is. So I don't think we should be allowed to leave this conference without having made a, come to an agreement about the B fields. So yesterday, <laughs> and I'm not saying solved it, of course, but, but um, the, the work of Sebastian shows this specific uh, amplification and the, the fact that it's not dynamically important. It all makes sense. You wrote there, but this is not the Regos and Taut field, but yesterday I was having dinner with Rudiger and he said, well, but the, but the convection's there, so it's really, I mean, if you got magnetic fields, you got magnetic fields. The, you know, sure, the convection might not be the right amount of lobiness and uh, the eddies are not quite what they should be, but so uh, is Regus and Tau wrong? I'm not saying wrong, I mean, that's a big word, well, but think, is, think, is that theory applicable? I don't think so because um, I think uh, if you have uh, this um, Further amplification of long time scales by the dynamo. Then, actually, um, if you reject the envelope, there will not be enough materials anymore. So, this will actually expand the result. So, I don't think that actually you would expect a strong dynamo. We don't see any. I mean, if there is any, we should have seen it in the uh, in the in our box. Are um, you sure? <laughs> well, I mean, we, we measured the magnetic field, right? And it didn't change any uh, much, much more anymore. And of course, you could argue, well, this happens on much long time scales, but these times are different. Probably you don't have these time scales, especially if you actually include a, a recommendation. This, this was not included here, but if you have that, then of course you expand the image quite quickly and, and install it. And you may just not have enough time to make the magnetic field much stronger. But that's actually sort of a simulation you still have to do that includes recommendation and magnetic field. Asha? Uh, I wonder if you can a little bit clarify the convection. So I'm just trying to understand. I little bit missed from the paper as well. So do you see the convective eddies themselves, or you just uh, say that uh, there is a convective no. instability? Well, we say there's a convective instability, and actually you sort of um, see the up. Or, or, I mean, you're talking about the uh, convection that's actually introduced by the shear instability, yeah, yeah. Right? not the initial. Uh, no, I was talking about the initial instability. Well, in the instability, we do see that. And, uh, so I just wonder if you can here. comment on the size of conductive like eddies as compared to the mixing work theory. Well, I mean, how, how big are they? Right, so we see the largest eddies. So this is actually sort of uh, comparing an initial setup model uh, where actually we mapped according to our uh, mapping procedure so that we retain the convective structure that's the right-hand side model. Here we suppressed it actually by changing the difference between the two gradients. And actually, you see the largest eddies here. And that is, that, that's the pattern. I think Sebastian also compared the um, um, uh, convective turnover times. I think they did not completely match, but I would have to look that up again. But at least you see that, con uh, that the envelope is convective. And how well this is resolved, that's, of course, still the question. I'm also not so sure whether, I mean, in the end, if you do the, um, the uh, plant, after the plunger phase, you quickly develop this spiral um, uh, pattern. And then, actually, this gets convective. I'm not so sure whether the initial comic pattern really plays such a Well, role. actually, I, I, to, to be honest, I was extremely excited to read that you can see convection when the paper was out. Yeah. So the 
My, my worry is that what we all could not get a proper energy deposition where it should be at the very beginning because we don't have proper viscosity. And proper viscosity is coupled with the convection. So I just was wondering how well the convection can be modeled now. Well, the large series roughly the convective pattern, but and, and the question is also, I mean, you could perhaps argue that it's the largest eddies that actually carry the energy away from the condition, right? So that's what you need to resolve. So I think the idea that was uh, sort of argued yesterday that you actually want to see the onset of the turbulent cascade, that should be enough. Because in the end, in a turbulent cascade, actually, uh, um, you actually mix completely in one large eddy turn over time, right? Uh, so that, that should be sort of But I guess I should put out, you don't have radiative losses. Okay. That's right. Uh, well, I well, think with all mass stars, this was, that is not important. Yeah. But this well, was I mean, you can't, can't lose energy. Yeah. So, so the convection can only just yeah. put it into something that can be used to the gas. All right. Okay. So, well, well, okay, maybe we can start talking about this. This might be some aspect. All right. So, Logan, we talk next. Oh, wow. Yes. Thank you guys for having me. It's just uh, Logan, can you use the mic? Oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. But then there's other, you know, that, uh, I guess, approximation that may not be another tool. That may not be Well, plus, I mean, you're, right, you're here, it's on a certain scale, right? It could yes. be higher uh, if you were better resolved. Hello? Okay. Oh, there we go. All right. All right, we all good now? All right. Uh, like I was saying, I want to thank you guys for having me. This has been a good opportunity for me to form collaborations and learn more about the field. So I'm going to present some of the work that I did using Manga with Bill Chang. All right, so what is Manga? So Manga is a moving mesh module that we've developed for Changa, which is an SPH code. And so Manga isn't really a true acronym, it's just moving mesh Changa. And um, one of the nice things about it is that although it's a moving mesh code, you can revert it back to <coughs> SPH mode. And then um, if you turn off the moving part of the moving mesh, you get a static mesh. So you can use several different numerical methods with this code. Um, for parallelization, it uses the charm++ language, which allows it to be very scalable. And for computing the Voronoi mesh, it uses the Voro++ libraries, which allows it to directly compute the Voronoi tessellation from the mesh generating points, rather than first computing the Dalani tessellation and then computing the Voronoi mesh from that. Uh, we've also recently developed a multi-stepping algorithm that we've implemented. Um, and it offers speed ups of four to five times over universal time stepping, which is nice because you want the code to run on a time scale that's less than the time scale of your PhD. And so um, we've, of course, implemented an ideal gas equation of state into Manga already. And we've also implemented the Mesa equation of state, which includes recombination energy. And more on that later. And we've tested it on several test cases, um, some standard problems in fluid dynamics, and have shown that it matches up well with the SPH results, except that it better resolves the shocks. And then it's also been applied to a star and hydrostatic balance and a stellar merger. OK, now onto the actual common envelope stuff. So for simulations, we used initial conditions that have become, seem to have become somewhat standard. Two solar mass red giant, uh, one solar mass companion, and I have to thank the other speakers for going through um, how the initial conditions for the giant are made. Uh, you make the star in Mesa, you get the entropy profile, construct an envelope with the same entropy, uh, entropy profile, and then um, we can damp the spurious velocities that we get in Manga and show that 
the density and temperature profiles that we get do indeed faithfully reproduce uh, what we get from MESA. And then uh, for the companion particle, one solar mass dark matter particle, we put it right at the surface of the giant in a circular orbit, so zero eccentricity to start off with, um, which, as we've talked about, may or may not be realistic initial conditions. So we're working on uh, getting a more realistic model for that. We use a simulation box of 23 AU with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, by the time we end the simulation, the outflow doesn't get anywhere near the boundary, so we don't have to deal with problems with that, uh, 800,000 particles. And then we do two different cases of rotation of the giant, 0% rotation, and then 95%. Uh, and the way that we do that is using the method of Morgan. Uh, we include a low density fluff outside, uh, high temperature, and then I guess it's not an initial condition, but the smallest time step that we achieve in the simulations is about 2.5 seconds. All right. Didn't want to deal with embedding this, so I'll just slide over to it. All right. So, let's see some pretty pictures. All right. Uh, like usual, plus marks the core, X marks the companion. So, let's see what this thing does. This is with co rotation. So we see initial plunge in where it ejects a large tidal tail there and unbinds a lot of mass. And then they're going to spiral in more slowly. And we'll see another larger tidal tail ejected around 75 days here. You know, there it goes. And we'll be able to see those tidal tails when we look at the plots of the unbound mass. I think there's another one, another smaller one coming up there. Yeah. Okay. So it seems we'll continue to spiral in more slowly. and. We end with an eccentricity of about 0 0.1. Uh, we run all the way to 240 days. The plan was to run to 120 days to match Ullman, but interesting stuff was still happening when we got to that point, so we decided to go to 240. All right. OK, so uh, you saw this plot earlier of the orbital separation. And then to make it a little easier to read on the right there, it's we smoothed it out and put it on a log scale. So we find that with co-rotation, we get a final separation that's about 0.4 solar mass greater than without, which kind of makes sense because you're including additional angular momentum. Um, it is possible the separation might still get significantly lower after 240 days, but we're getting dangerously close to the scale of our gravitational softening lengths at this point, so it might be dangerous to run farther. All right, so here's the money plot, uh, the fraction of our envelope that's unbound. So we include recombination energy, and we find that doing so unbinds 60-some uh, percent of the envelope in both cases, a little more for co-rotation since there's that extra kinetic energy. Um, we do find, though, that if we don't include, well, OK, first of all, I should say we're defining unbound mass as um, total energy greater than zero, total energy including potential, kinetic, and thermal energy. If we don't include internal energy, it gets much lower. We only unbind about 8% by the end. So this, include, this indicates that the treatment of the internal energy is very important in determining how much of the envelope is unbound. And on the right there, you see a density slice. It's at t equals 15 days, I believe one of our simulations, and the black boundary there uh, encloses the bound mass. Right? So you see the tidal tail there uh, is unbound. All right, so uh, some conclusions. I've already said some of this. When you include co-rotation versus non-rotating, uh, it results in a larger orbital separation and mass ejection, both of which you might expect because you're increasing the energy and angular momentum present. Um, we've also found that the internal energy plays a large role in unbinding the envelope. So, if so, we might need to include radiation physics if the energy is not if the energy from recombination is radiated away. It would be it would make a large impact on how much of the the envelope is unbound. And then um, we also may need to change our treatment of the gravitational softening uh, so that we can. 
we can run farther if our simulations get to a lower separation. But uh, as Luke was talking about, it can be non-trivial to do that since it would change the um, gravitational potential energies and such. All right, I think I am under time, so I will be happy to answer any questions. Um, I don't think we were able to resolve the Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities, no. Okay, you don't. Okay, so we might, we haven't looked at the answer. You, have, you, have, you, have, you got to do a slice uh, yeah. projection, right? Yeah. <coughs> we have done well, that, that. there was one slice, but I think that was still too, too early to see. I mean, there was 15 days, the slices were shown, right? Yeah, yeah I, I have done so some other slices. They're, they're all projections. They're all projections. Well, I've done some other slices too, although they weren't shown here, but um, I don't recall, I don't think we could resolve the Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities though. Uh, so, so I have a question, but it's actually more general question for people who do SPH and OP mesh uh, simulations. So there's been some debate here of whether the internal energy contributes, how much it contributes to the unbinding. Have you tried taking like a, some early where you have cells which are, according to the mechanical criteria, bound, but with internal energy, unbound. Just remembering who those cells are, plotting them sometime later, seeing if they're bound or unbound. And this will be good for SPH, moving mesh will be kind of a fudge, because you just affect a bit, but this will give you some handle what percentage of mesh was unbound because of the internal energy. Have you tried doing this? No, we haven't tried that, but that's a good idea. Well, I, think, I think you have to be careful because like, if there are enough mass flux that it doesn't really work with moving right. mesh. So, but you can you can add tracer for things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I'm curious about your your multiple tidal tails. That's uh, something I haven't seen before. Uh, do you have an idea what's uh, what's causing that? No. <laughs> That's the short answer. I think yeah. it's the core to yeah. secondary mass ratio. Mm -hmm. So, like, is your secondary much lighter than the combined other star, or are they about the same? So, you see this, like, yeah. in Orsula, yeah. where yeah. in Orsula's group they yeah. varied the mass ratio, yeah. you see it emerge when the core the and the secondary are similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, questions, comments? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But we also compared models with and with algae combination, right? And uh, did they show any difference? Uh, can you go back to them? So I'm not talking about including, oh, including or not including oh, okay. the energy, including the actual putting the combination in the simulation or not. So you're asking about uh, different equation state, yeah? Yes. One okay, so, 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 so we are not sure. About uh, 80 bag equations. We need to study that a little bit. This is why it's not nothing. Yeah. 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 We did run simulation of the We did run simulation with 80 bag equations. We don't trust it. Just so a very, very quick comment. We really have to make a distinction between something changes when you use the um, tabulated versus ideal equation of state. We know that that's true. We've seen it in all codes. And then the other side is how you define unbound. Do you use or not thermal slash internal energy? And actually, there's, there is a difference between thermal and internal when you go to tabulated equation of state. And you can try that by declaring your material unbound. First, you do the strict mechanical energy only. Then you can add your thermal, and then you can add your internal. And you will have more and more unbound material. Yeah, but initially, nobody should add recombination energy because it's a potential energy. Which has Indeed, absolutely. Energy. absolutely. So that's a really big no-no, but I can see. Initially. I mean, it's just nobody should do that. Ever. Right. So please, when you write up, explain exactly what you mean by thermal, internal, what's in it. Yeah. Because it's not always so, so clear, right? Yeah. We make, we intend different things. Right. Yeah. yeah. 
And that partition may not be so easy with the basic question state. Um, maybe who someone who makes the actual state explicitly with the point which quantity from the from the question of state you use, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, like they just give you the internal energy. I'm not sure they might actually have to look at the code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the documentation is you know yeah. lacking, but the right. Well, <laughs> that's just lying. Yeah. So you might actually have to look at what the code's actually produced. But isn't, um, isn't it the, the, the most curious thing to just uh, let, according to the kinetic energy, and leave all the other terms out? And then yeah. Yeah, 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 I think that, I, I agree. Also, I should yeah. say that MESA doesn't have recombination of energy included. It will be added when you go to the lower levels. So, I mean, it's always important what's your zero level uh -huh. of energy. In the case of MESA, it's the ionized state is where you start. <coughs> So if you go to recombinant state, the energy is added, it's not vice versa. So if, when you right. calculate initially ionized plasma, yeah. the recombination energy is not in there. It's when I you see. do the delta okay. E so, for energy, then it's added up. I see. Okay. So, so in fact, the answer is that's actually without recombination energy. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 right. You know, whether something is unbound or bound yeah. really has to do with its bulk kinetic energy, period. Yeah. Yeah. Period. And the, the other future. stuff, the other stuff is all potential to do work, right. but um, but it is not whether the stuff is on an unclosed orbit, and and, and I think that's you know the what we should be using as a baseline criterion for unbound. But, but I mean the, the product I have shown that the, the Sebastian did with this uh, very long term run. I mean this actually was the kinetic energy only and uh, was run for six thousand days or so. And you get a pretty complete ejection, yeah. assuming, of course, that you can use all the uh, local energy deposition, right? Mm -hmm. So that's still the assumption. Yeah. Right, yeah, well, that's a big assumption, yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, but even, e even if you could use it, right, again, to use all of the internal energy, you have to cool to absolute zero. So, I mean, that's obviously well, not Well, okay, possible. so, so that's, that's not completely fair, right? So you, you, want, you want to use, basically, one part of some fair fraction of the internal energy, right? So you don't have to cool it at absolute zero, right? If you're at 100,000 degrees, you cool it at 10,000, that's 90%. Okay? You're there already. Okay? So that's, so that's well, not completely fair. That's 90%, right? but I mean, yeah. that could translate into a very large difference in the amount of unbound mass. Well, that's like... So right, it depends on how close to that threshold mm -hmm. the, ma the mass elements are. Right, I mean, like, that's an expansion in a factor of maybe three, in mm -hmm. terms of spatial and density decrease about factor of uh, 30, right? Mm -hmm. That's easy, that's, 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 that's easy, that's cap, that's, can be captured. That's not, I don't think that's a big deal. Well, I guess another way of looking at it would be, um, uh, so internal energy really doesn't help an individual mass element become unbound. It helps uh, other mass elements adjacent yes. become unbound because it does work on them. Right. And uh, and so if you've got material that's on its way out, that's got a positive energy mechanical plus uh, potential, um, and it does additional work on its surroundings, yes. it may not matter at all. Right. Um, whereas, uh, let me see, this is going the way I wanted to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think yeah, that's why, I mean, another right. way to put that, right, is yeah. that, like, the Bernoulli constant right. was defined along a free mm -hmm. streamline. Yeah. And I think yeah. that what we're hearing here is that there's not necessarily a lot of free streamlines once That's you right. have a big mess, right? right. So, 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 so if you make the argument that like the Bernoulli integral is what you care about, mm -hmm. right? That stuff comes out, right? For adiabatic winds, the Bernoulli integral must be uh, positive mm -hmm. even before his side point, right? And side point is basically where it escapes. Okay, so you use that criterion, basically you say, well, like, the wind doesn't escape until it's side point. If you actually use the Bernoulli criterion, well, it escapes as soon as basically it's positive, right? It's well, it tells you what its local, for example, yes. parameter is, yes. but it doesn't tell you that it will make it to infinity because it might run into something else. That's right, yeah. exactly. But Bernoulli that's is even problem. worse because it doesn't put internal engine enthalpy, which is even like a bigger term. I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's the but, integral that Paul is discussing, right? Yeah, but to, to speak about the flaws, this is, I mean, this is what I see when I have recombination outflows. I mean, yeah. you have established those flaws which are just gradually evolving, and I didn't estimate it from the enthalpy point of view, uh, but it's exactly how it should be. I mean, because yeah. they just constant for the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's exactly. Enthalpy is a, 
definitely a, an improvement, I think, because it's more of a measure of what's useful work. Yeah. Um, but it still doesn't tell you whether that work will be expended or that will be done, used to do work. What's the typical cooling time? Or where. Time? Right. Yeah. yeah. What's the typical cooling time? If they're big enough, then yeah, you, yeah. you, know, you yeah. cool it only in the outworld where you already, the right. density so is low, you won't do any, the, any the, work. The question is basically um, where the, the question combination of optical depth, cooling time, and dynamic time. That's the thing which we have to answer. I, I yes. think there's no, uh, the, the current cooling cooling uh, prescription, um, if, if you really use them, uh, then you will find for, for this common envelope, their cooling time is so short uh, at, at the uh, yeah, boundary. Maybe right. it's only one second. Mm -hmm. So for, for example, if it's cooling time, at the edge is one second. That means you, if you go into 1,000 optical depths into that, from that layer, go yeah. into that, and uh, that means this layer cooling time is approximately 1,000 second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, 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 no, 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 mm -hmm. if you cool uh, from ionized state to <laughs> molecular state, it become optically thin. Then you go to the next layer, and progressively into more deeper place. I would say the really short cooling time represents the fact that you're out of equilibrium if yeah, you yeah, were yeah. to include cooling, yeah, because yeah. then the cooling time would match the heating time, and you would be. So yeah, like yeah. when you see a like tiny cooling time, that means oh. If I were including that term, I would never arrive at this solution for yes, the thermodynamic yes. quantity. Yes. Okay. I just want to say this reminds me of the accretion discretion, the irradiably inefficient accretion discretion term where people for ever, and I'm not even sure it's ever been said, uh, completely satisfied as to as to whether the uh, outflows are actually unbound or whether they're just right. enormous mm -hmm. convective eddies that people yeah. are arguing. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Well, I mean, actually, yeah. I think maybe you're, you know, I don't know exactly how to do this, but I mean, if you have, let's say, uh, material that's all heading out, right, and and it has a formally positive energy mechanical plus potential, um, then I think it's reasonable to say that absent any other assumptions about the interstellar medium, mm -hmm. it's unbound. So I think maybe. It's not just the value of some combination of the energies, but also the geometry of the flow that allows you to say, you know, whether material is bound or not. I mean, that, that's like, it sounds like strong equivalence to weak equivalence. I mean, there's, there's a strong bound, strong unbound equation <laughs> is that, uh -huh. is that. But I mean, the thermal energy, I'm hesitant about not being unique. It is, it is the potential to do work. You just don't know whether it's going to do its work. But the fact that it's there and available I mean, you can't have a star that's that has more thermal energy than uh, potential energy and be stable, uh, right? No, yeah, stable, so, right? Yes, yeah. so that's why. So it's that's true. Enter. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, no. So it seems like ignoring thermal energy, not so including this, if you're for the you know you're trying to understand initial state, doesn't quite make sense because it is a potential pressure gradient in some sense. Once you be, once you disturb it, you've got thermal energy there that may be useful for pushing things out, which is what you're really asking the recombination. That you're you're going to invoke the recombination to happen once it cools to now give you a new source of thermal energy, right? That's all it does. The, yes. The, the recombination so energy turns into thermal energy, turns into pressure gradients, which yeah. is the same thing as what you're asking for. What, you know, with the thermal energy. So I'm not sure it's like ignoring the thermal energy in your initial description of what's bound and unbound makes sense either. Because it will be available. Once you disturb the initial equilibrium, that's thermal energy that could be available to push things out. There is a strict criterion for unbound. Actually, the strictest criterion is does it leave yeah. the thermal energy that's available to push things out. It's a lower limit on absolutely being yeah. certain things. When you just have thermal energy, you don't know how it's going to redistribute it. It could decide to give right. all that energy to one particle, 
It should have common sense is that it will, you yeah. know, push some out and some will so, stay down. So the universe works on Democrats that slows down to 1% generally. It's full of mechanisms that concentrate things like uh, matter in one place. Right? <laughs> 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 well, gravity is the one in that part of the principle, right? So, yeah, yeah, so I think the... Um, of course, I mean, one, one way to determine this would be to run these simulations for long enough to have everything yes. you know, convert to kinetic energy. The problem with that is that at some point the energy errors that you have in right. the simulation become too large. And that actually sort of prevents us from going much longer than mm -hmm. I've shown. Right? I mean, then we get the energy errors of like 5 to 10 percent, and still, like, I mean, the binding energy in the envelope that's still left there is not of that order. Yeah. Right. So that's actually sort of we can determine sort of like maybe 90 percent of the envelope is, is ejected by that criterion, but that's not. Well, I think, I think so that's, that's another frontier on the numerical side that was not so much emphasized on the last is actually how to handle the energy events. And, and, and for the grid codes, it's probably mostly because of the coupling between um, the um, drug exposure and, and the hydrodynamics, right? So right. that's actually the uh, largest uncertainty we have there. And that's also something that we should add to the list of the frontiers. Right. Yeah. So we, we don't run simulation to the infinity as well as anyone else, but what I found is that, I mean, it's really hard to find a, an agenda which will be just marginally unbound. In fact, if it will be unbound, then the kinetic energy will be much larger than the thermal energy that it has at that moment, and it will be not just like a, exceeding the, like, by tiny, tiny fraction of what will be continued for unbound. So I don't think we are doing too bad in general. I think that because nature doesn't uh, like the perfect fine tuning, so we're fine. So, perfect for tuning will be a problem. Right, so, let's just call a discussion now.